BIS doesn't treat small nations very fairly. It turns out the international order tends not to treat a lot of nation states fairly. Hey folks, Flo here with Blockchain North. I'm here with none other than Charles Hoskinson, founder and CEO of Cardano. I don't know if you like to put it that way, but I want to ask you about the terms constitution and sure. government that you just mentioned in your talk. Those sure. are not terms that you hear every day when hearing about blockchain. Yeah, we're building a digital nation if you really think about it. I mean, look at it. You've got money, you got millions of people around, you got voting, you got stuff like supply chain, digital identity. Ultimately, nation states are going to use this as their back end. So you need a governance system that's transnational and fair for everybody. With that in mind, could you speak a little bit about the importance of CIP 1694 and the proposal? So 1694 is basically our best approximation as a community of how to do what's called a minimum viable government. So the basic idea is the government can then be recursively used to make a better government. So every few months you just keep upgrading it and growing it. So it's like going from the iPhone to the iPhone of today. Back then, 2007, it was revolutionary, but no one would buy the iPhone of, of 2007 today because the world has moved on. So similarly, when you think about governance, the goal there is to say, can we get something out where the government can build a better government and then that government can build a better government? So this recursive concept, but then it can run the system. So it can do things like the treasury of Cardano. It has half a billion dollars in it right now. It's inaccessible. It's locked up until the government turns on. They're actually in charge of that budget. So they get to decide how much should be spent on marketing, how much should be spent on development, and this is by the people for the people. Everybody holds data, they get to make that decision. So it really is like a nation state, and you got voting and campaigns and delegated representatives and everything, and it's uh, real cool to do that and design that, and we're having a lot of fun with it. Do you ever in your wildest dreams hope that blockchain would be actually adopted by governments themselves? I think blockchains need to make governments irrelevant. It's kind of a weird thing that we have these nation state borders that are artificial, especially when you see like the Canada-US border, you're out in the national forest, you're like, okay, over there's Canada and here's the United States. It's, <laughs> come on, it's just, it's made of stuff, just like money. And the point about a government is to provide services to us that the private sector can't because we can't trust the central authority. Like you probably don't want your local bank being in charge of the US dollar, for example. So the blockchain is a third option where it's neither a government nor a company, it's a protocol and it's a new tool for governments and corporations to use to get rid of corruption, to improve efficiency, and ultimately make the system as a whole fair and more equitable for everybody. You're speaking to a European, so that border between Canada and the US has bugged me ever since I've lived in Canada, so I hear you. You also spoke about- It's the same way. You have bars, like one side's Belgium, the other side's another country. That's very true, yeah. yeah. So um, you also spoke about the responsibility of the blockchain community in terms of the power that blockchain represents. Can you expand on that? Well, this is, the first social exponential system of our lifetime. It's, uh, it's something where a small group of people can build something that could influence and change the lives of millions of people. So how their government works, how corruption works, how money works, all these things. And for both good and bad, you could build a CBDC and combine it with social credit, and then suddenly AI gets to decide whether your money is on or off today, yeah. which is pretty scary. And that's what China's doing, actually, with their, uh, with their, crypto, with their uh, digital currency. On the other hand, you could build a system where a small group of people can build something to expose corruption at the highest level and completely change a government because they have a whistleblowing function. So it works in both directions. And the difference between old systems and this one is the old systems were the providence of powerful people. So only a small group of people got to play with those tools. These systems, everybody gets to play with them and any one person can change the world. So it's very exciting, but you have to have a lot of wisdom in the process. So I spent two years of my life in Africa and I know you've spent quite a lot of time recently, but also places like Mongolia. Yeah. I'm wondering how those trips have shaped or evolved your vision of blockchain over the years. Well, it just shows you why we do what we do. People deserve to have economic identity. That's a human right. And it's not okay to have three billion people that are left out and it's also not okay to have the other people who aren't left out take advantage of the three billion people who are. I mean, look at the lithium mines in Congo or these other things. We have these amazing battery power cars, but where does that come from? And it's too long that we've had this social myopia and we live in one world with one human race. And the point of blockchain technology is to remind everybody of that and go from shouldn't be evil to can't be evil by design. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you for a price prediction on the ADA, but I am going to ask you for your surest predictions in a sort of macro sense for blockchain and adoption over the coming years. I think blockchain over the next 10, 20 years is going to grow to hundreds of millions, eventually billions of people and nation states are going to run on it. I said that years ago, now you got El Salvador and you got a lot of other things coming. You know, so it's, it's happening real time because people are tired. 
They just want to be treated fairly. And it turns out the BIS doesn't treat small nations very fairly. It turns out the international order tends not to treat a lot of nation states fairly. So blockchain is a way for them to come together, just like we did with unions way back in the day, and create a new way to run the world that's a lot better for everybody and allows us to live in a safer, more peaceful world. So welcome to Canada. You're Obviously you have a connection to Canada via Ethereum, yeah. I suppose. Uh, do you have a message for Canadians that's particular to them, maybe? Keep building. Thank you very much, Charles. Cheers. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Really appreciate it.